morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other on our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I'm so glad that you have joined us this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room, and welcome also to those of you joining us via our live stream. Before we begin our worship service, I have just a few announcements to share. Many of you know that Provincetown has a new Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And the new director, Donna Walker, has been in her position for two months now. So we thought she was ready to come talk to us. Um, Racial Justice Provincetown is hosting a meet and greet with her this week. The meet and greet will be out on our lawn on Tuesday from noon to one. And Racial Justice Provincetown will be providing a picnic lunch. Following a short presentation by Donna, we will have a time for a Q&A. So come get to know her and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And an RSVP is not required, but it would be pretty helpful for us to have a sense of how many people might be coming in order to provide that picnic lunch. So if you think that you're going to be coming, please let me know. <clears throat> also a reminder that Great Music at 5 starts up again today. The concert will be Curtain Up with favorite songs from the Great Musicals presented by the Great Music at 5 Broadway Ensemble. Hopefully you can come back for that this evening at 5. And it looks like a beautiful day today. We keep getting so lucky with those. So I invite those of you who are attending in person to join us out on our lawn for our coffee hour after the service. And everyone is invited to attend our Zoom coffee hour on Tuesday evening at 5 o'clock. Now let us continue by affirming our community's covenant. I invite you to repeat each line after me. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace. To dwell together in peace. To seek the truth in love. To seek the truth in love. And to help one another. This time I invite Ellen to light our chalice for us. As we light our chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you watching online to light a candle wherever you are. And that way we can feel connected even while we are apart. Fire in the Universe by Sean Trapp. <clears throat> our chalice reminds us that the fire within ourselves is the same fire that illuminates the universe. It is our reminder that all is connected, even though the space of the void is vast. And our experience here is but a blip in the cosmic timeline. This flame is our promise that in all our smallness and our short time on this earth, that we live intently and deeply with love for one another. Please join me now in a spirit of prayer and meditation. If you have a joy or a sorrow on your heart this morning, you are welcome to light a silent candle during the prayer or at any time during the service at the table to the right of the pulpit. And there is a journal there to record your thoughts and prayers. Our meditation this morning is by Mark Bellatini.
I am part of you, O oh, truth unfolding. I am part of you. I am part of a cosmos. I cannot see either its edge or its end. How amazing. I am part of a galaxy of a million billion stars. They say it's a pinwheel. How wonderful. I am part of a system of planets that swing around a small parent star. How strong the hands of invisible gravity to hold it all together just so. I am part of a planet, blue and green, along with mountains and seas, sponges and spores, lichen and lava, robins and rain, periwinkles and perch, centipedes and cities. How great the variety. How astonishing the mutual dependence of it all. I am part of a species that belongs to a grouping of animals called mammalia, and so is every other human being, equally so. I am part of a political unit called a nation. There are many nations, each of them dear in so many ways to its local citizens. I am part of a family with ethnicity, practice, and love in the form of food, rooted in the mountains of Amelia. Others know other roots, other practices. I am part of a circle of friends rooted not in ethnicity or food, but in simple, redemptive love. I am part of a climate region, part of a state, part of a city, part of a neighborhood, part of a congregation. And with you, I am part and parcel of this moment, this simple silence which lasts but a few breaths and then is gone forever. But like the cosmos, galaxy, planet, species, nation, climate, city, neighborhood, family, and circles of friendship, it is precious, a present for which I give thanks. Let us enjoy a moment of silence.
The reading this morning is a reading for all ages called Biscuits and Star Stuff by Reverend Teresa I. Soto. Mama, said Quinn. What's up, Mama asked. She could see the sun shining on the top of Quinn's curly hair. She measured another spoonful of mayonnaise into the bowl. Mama was making drop biscuits. We traced our shadows on paper during art class. Uh-huh, Mama said. Did you like that? Not that much, Quinn said. My shadow wasn't as long as most of the others. What did your teacher say about that part? Quinn let out a long breath. They blew air toward their forehead and made the curls at the front of their head bounce. Miss Malone says that every single body is different. Mama nodded. She says that everybody is a good body. Quinn mumbled. Do you want to pour the milk in, Mama asked. Biscuits for dinner. I love biscuits. Mmm, Quinn said. I wash my hands with soap. Do the milk? Go ahead, Mama said. Quinn very carefully poured the milk into the bowl. Thanks, sweets, Mama said. She took a fork from the drawer and mixed the, everything together gently. Quinn watched Mama scoop the dough onto the cookie sheet and slide them into the hot oven. They watched the biscuits for a while. Mama, they're puffing up, they said. Yep, baking powder and milk together, do that to the dough, Mama said. I'm gonna grow, right? Mama, Quinn asked. You sure are, you grow a little bit every day. And my body is good, Quinn said. Action Q, your body and my body, our bodies and other people's bodies are fantastic. How do you know? Quinn asked. Do you remember when you learned about atoms in school? Quinn nodded. The very small parts of everything? Our bodies are made up of things like carbon and oxygen atoms, Mama said. And it turns out that those atoms came from the stars to make up the building blocks of Earth. You are made from pieces of the stars, Quinn. Stars, Quinn asked. They were starting to smile. Mama was smiling too. Stars, Quinn. When you feel not too sure that your body is good, or when you're waiting and waiting for your body to grow, you remember that your body is good and that it comes from good things. Okay, Mama, Quinn said. Mama took the biscuits out of the oven. She blew on a piece of a biscuit to cool it off, buttered it, and gave it to Quinn. Suddenly, Quinn's eyes grew wide. They looked at the biscuits. None were the same. The one on the right in the middle was a bit smaller than the others. Mama, Quinn said, they're all different. Mama nodded. And we're probably going to eat them all, right? Probably all of them, Mama said with chili and salad. And they're made of good stuff, Quinn said. Fantastic, said Mama. Quinn smiled and went to wash up for dinner. Biscuits. Thank you. Now is the time in our service where we take a collection for the ongoing support of this meeting house and our shared ministry. 
As we enjoy a musical reflection, we welcome your donations here in the sanctuary or online through PayPal or Venmo. You can find that information on our website, uumh.org. On and off-site, your offerings will now be gratefully received. us too 
that we are star stuff. We are not insignificant. We are magnificent. We are holy. NASA says the James Webb Telescope will look beyond distant worlds around other stars and probe the mysterious structures and origins of our universe and our place in it. Our place in the universe. Kind of seems like NASA and religious communities have some overlap there, doesn't it? We are also contemplating our place in the universe. It is said that astronauts who have had the opportunity to view Earth from space are forever changed by the experience. There's even a name for it, the overview effect. One of the astronauts on the Apollo mission said, when we originally went to the moon, our total focus was on the moon. We weren't thinking about looking back at the Earth. But now that we've done it, that may well have been the most important reason we went. The iconic Earthrise image was snapped by astronaut Bill Anders. And seeing cameras turn around in a live feed of Earth for the first time, even for viewers at home, was absolutely life-changing. There was a startling recognition that the nature of the universe was not as I had been taught, said Edward Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon. I not only saw the connectedness, I felt it. I was overwhelmed with the sensation of physically and mentally extending out into the cosmos. I realized that this was a biological response of my brain attempting to reorganize and give meaning to information about the wonderful and awesome processes that I was privileged to do. Look again at that dot, Carl Sagan wrote. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, Every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. It's quite common for astronauts who experience the overview effect to engage in global philanthropic work after their return to Earth. NASA astronaut Ron Guerin, who traveled to space on the Space Shuttle Discovery in 2008, felt the overview effect on his third spacewalk and started a philanthropic group called Fragile Oasis for astronauts who've experienced similar philosophical shifts. Joanna Macy, a philosopher and ecologist who I often quote to you, says you don't have to go to space to experience the overview effect. You don't have to be an astronaut. You can just feel it by closely studying an image of Earth from space. When you study images of Earth, you're struck with such a gladness at the beauty and the originality of it, she says, that you don't have time to think about how it's going to turn out. All you know is you'll serve it to the last breath. And maybe you don't have to look at a picture or look down at Earth at all to feel a shift in perspective. Maybe you can just look up at the night sky. The Reverend Jenny Barrington says that when she looks up at the stars at night, she feels humbled by how little we are and by how little we know about them. 
I wonder at the uncountable number of stars that I cannot see and that no one on earth can see yet. And I also feel something companionable. I think of people all over the world also looking up at the night sky. I feel a reassurance that the stars themselves are right up there overhead, patiently waiting for us to turn and see them. And I wonder if something, anything up there, feels something in regard to us here below. Is our regard of the night sky in any way mutual? What does it mean to connect with something shining, to contemplate that connection? My earliest memory of doing this, Jenny says, was when I was a very young school child, probably in the third grade. Some of the older students in the school were doing a survey. They were asking the various classes what they thought about the U.S. government continuing to spend money on space exploration. Did we think the money should instead go to building schools, bridges, and roads? I recall that there was some question as to whether this survey was too sophisticated for our young class. But the older students really wanted to hear our thoughts made me feel valued to be included. I think that the majority of our class voted for the astronauts, Jenny says. But I think the larger point is that the question got us all wondering. As a child, a collective thrill about space exploration was all around me, Jenny says. Everyone was talking about it and we watched reports of the liftoffs on TV. We also watched the original series Star Trek. We drank tang and ate those high-energy snack bars like the astronauts reportedly ate. Until those older students posed their questions to my class, I had never had any cause to question whether money spent on space exploration might be better spent here on Earth, Jenny says. To me, for people to explore the stars was as natural as it was for them to build schools, bridges, and roads. My mother is fond of saying that I learned to count not one through ten, but in reverse. She says I used to go around saying ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off. I'm still inspired by the stars, Jenny says. And I still believe that space exploration is a valuable endeavor. Maybe the value of space exploration is simply the change in perspective that it offers, the overview effect. We could all use a little of that, right? We need to blur those man-drawn lines around the countries so that we care more about what is happening on the other side of the world. We need to start seeing water and minerals and oil as finite resources that must be protected and not used up with such abandon and disregard. We need to sense our smallness so that petty troubles and egos and worries don't take up more space in our lives than is their due. And we need to remember that we are made of star stuff, that we are magnificent, that we are holy. Because just as seeing ourselves as too big is a problem, seeing ourselves as too small isn't serving us very well either. Author and teacher Sarah Durham Wilson writes, the way you alchemize a soulless world into a sacred world is by treating everyone as if they are sacred, until the sacred in them remembers. So if we are not all going to become astronauts, how do we change our perspective on the universe? How do we remember that we are sacred, that those around us are sacred? When a photographer can't change a scene, they change their angle and lens to capture the best of that scene. That's kind of what the astronauts did. They changed their angle up there in space and it changed everything. 
Maybe down here, we could change our lens, try on different ways of seeing the universe. For instance, what if we tried to believe just for this week that the universe was conspiring to bless us? It's not too outlandish, is it? I mean, we all often fall victim to bouts of paranoia where it seems the universe is conspiring against us. So what if the universe was conspiring to bless us? Play with me here. Now, mostly I tend to think of the universe as rather random guided by all those scientific principles that I believe in but don't quite understand, I don't ascribe to the God's plan theory of the universe very much. I see it as neither benevolent nor evil, just unfolding. But let me tell you about something that happened to me in my late 20s that I will never forget. It's a silly story, but it has stayed with me. I was living in Brookline while I went to seminary. It was a perfect location. I could walk to school. I could take the Green Line to church. I lived with a load of roommates, so it was cheap. It was very convenient to pretty much everywhere, except Cambridge. It was kind of a pain to get to Cambridge. You had to take the 66 bus, which stopped every two seconds and waited at innumerable stoplights, and it just always seemed to take forever. Well, one night I was invited to a party in Cambridge. I still went, of course, and I had a good time and I met some new people. But when it was time to go, I was not looking forward to taking the bus home, if it was even still running. And well, this was before Uber and Lyft were invented. Um, so when this guy I met at the party offered to drive me back to Brookline, because he lived over that way too, you bet I took him up on it. Now let me just pause here and reassure my mother, who I think is watching via our live stream. <laughs> Mom, it was a seminary party. <laughs> These were all dorky church people. And he was giving a ride to several other people as well. So I was never going to be alone with this person. This ride was a huge blessing and not much of a risk. But anyway, I made it home just fine. He dropped me right at my door, first corner. This was Saturday night, very late. So Sunday morning dawn, and what do dorky church people do after having been out half the night? We get up and get ready for church. So I did that, and I got showered and dressed, but when I went to leave, I could not find my phone. I had my keys, my wallet, everything else, but not my phone. I knew I had it last night because I used it to check the time when I was getting a ride back in this guy's car. Oh no, I had left my phone in his car. I had no way of getting in touch with him. I knew his first name only, no idea of his phone number or email address. The only thing I could think of was to email my friend whose party it had been and explain the situation to her and describe him and ask if she could connect us somehow. So I did that, but there was nothing else to really do, so I went to church on the green line. Now something that I often did when I lived in the city and when I knew I had a little bit of extra time was to get off the subway a few stops early and walk the rest of the way. It was a way to get some exercise and it was just much nicer to be above ground. So that's what I did that morning. I got off at Copley Square just two stops shy of Arlington Street, which is the church I was going to. And as I was walking down Boylston Street, I saw someone waving to me on the sidewalk. It was the guy from last night. <laughs> Can you believe that? And he said, hey, I have your phone. You left it in my car last night. And I said, oh, I'm so relieved. And how funny that you happen to be here on the sidewalk. And he explained to me that he was in the choir at Trinity Church, and they have two services. And he had already sung in one, and he was running out to feed his meter before going back for the second service. And I, who happened to get off the subway two stops early, happened to be walking by the very spot where he had parked his car. And he handed me my phone. And it's a stupid story, I know, but I will never forget it. 
because it was the first time that I have ever thought that maybe the universe was conspiring to bless me because it was more than coincidence, wasn't it? All those things aligning at once to bring ease to my day. And all day long, I walked around appreciating the magic and purpose of everything around me. Things that I wouldn't have noticed or paid attention to, I now saw as a gift. Because the universe was blessing me, wasn't it? And I wasn't going to take it for granted or be ungrateful about any moment or detail of it. I remember thinking at the time that that thing with the phone was serendipitous. I like that word. And I have since learned that it comes from a fairy tale called The Three Princes of Serendip, in which the heroes were always making discoveries by accident of things they were not even in quest of. But recently I've learned a better word for that day. It defines not the day or the outcome or the happy discoveries, but the perspective on the day, the outlook on the universe. Pronoia, a feeling that the world around you is conspiring to do you good. It's the opposite of paranoia. Pronoia, the universe is conspiring to bless you. There is a love holding you. Now this is different than believing that you are the center of the universe. I just want to clarify that. If those NASA pictures have taught us anything, it is that we are definitely not the center of the universe. This isn't narcissism on a grand scale. This is a thought experiment. And it doesn't even take any real change in circumstance to start experimenting and viewing the world this way, even for just short amounts of time. It requires only a change of lens on your camera, a different vantage point on life. Carrie Grote was recently diagnosed with cancer. One of the great disappointments she felt as she received her diagnosis was that she had never found the love of her Single and childless when I was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, she said, I looked around my life and I came up sputtering and sobbing from the wave of grief washing over me. I thought I'd be doing this alone. No husband, no kids, no great love. How wrong I was. At the first appointment with my neuro-oncologist, one of the nurses diligently hauled in chair after chair for the great loves of my life who came with me that horrible day and many days after that. I sat and listened while the doctor explained the 12-month treatment plan, focusing on my breathing, then looked around the room, filled with great loves of my life, incredible women friends whom I've met at various stages of my life. Suddenly, Carrie saw that she was being held by a love greater than the one love she had imagined. <clears throat> Carrie died recently, and she left a long message to her friends and family at the end. It doesn't matter what some dreamed of romantic partner thinks of you, she said. It matters what you believe about yourself. What you believe about your life. Friends, you are made of good stuff. You are star stuff. You are magnificent. You are holy. What might we think about the universe if we changed our perspective on it? Might we be in awe at how small we are in 
from such a vast expanse of space? Might we start a charity because suddenly everything feels so connected? Might we live with more joy and less fear because the universe is conspiring to bless us? Might we embrace the life we have instead of the life we wish we had or thought we had? Because it's a miracle that any of us are even here at all. All those old stars hooking hydrogen and helium into things like carbon, oxygen, iron, and calcium to form our very bodies? Might it mean treating everyone as if they are sacred until the sacred in them remembers. Lynn Unger, who is basically our UMH Poet Laureate this year, she doesn't know that, I should probably tell her, <laughs> wrote a poem this week after seeing the images from the James Webb Telescope. My favorite line from it says, the galaxies have been out there all along. You choose what to make of actually seeing your place in it all. The galaxies have been out there all along. You choose what to make of actually seeing your place in it all. Amen. And blessed be. It has become our practice to pose a question based on the theme of the service each week. It can be a topic of sharing out on the lawn today or with friends during the week. If you want to delve deeper into this conversation, I hope you can join us on Tuesday at 5 on our Zoom coffee hour. Our question this week is, tell us about a time when the universe conspired to bless you. Tell us about a time when the universe conspired to bless you. I'll end with the benediction by Mark Bellatini, who wrote our prayer as well. Go in peace, live simply, gently, at home in yourselves. Act justly, speak justly, remember the depth of your own compassion. Forget not your power in the days of your powerlessness. Do not desire to be wealthier than your peers, and stint not your hand of charity. Practice forbearance. Speak the truth or speak not. Take care of yourselves as bodies, for you are a good gift. Crave peace for all peoples in the world beginning with yourselves, and go as you go with the dream of that peace alive in your heart. Blessed be, go in peace. <clears throat>